This will be a sign unto you. You will find a, a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. On a Christmas Eve many, many years ago, three astronauts by the name of Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders were on a mission to the moon. And that particular year, they celebrated Christmas right there from their orbit, just above the moon's surface. This is a picture of what they saw. And during that particular telecast, one of the astronauts began to read the creation story from Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And Borman, one of the astronauts then, well, said goodbye on that lunar telecast by saying this, good night and good luck and a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you on God's good earth. I'll take a look at that picture. Take a good look at it. It's amazing, it's astonishing that man, a human being, walked on the moon. But what's even more astonishing and amazing is that the God of all creation came to the earth. And what's even more astonishing than that is that God did it for us. He did it for you and he did it for me. I mean, God only had one agenda that night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and that was to bring us to himself. Because you see, God is crazy about us. He loves us so much. And this is the simple message of Christmas. God refuses to be God without us. And so God emptied himself and became one of us. That's the message of Christmas. The theologians call it kenosis. Emptying, the Greek word for emptying, that God emptied himself and took residence in a babe in Bethlehem. I told you God is crazy about us. It said that Henry David Thoreau, once on Walden Pond, spent the whole day with water up to his neck. He wanted to get the perspective of a frog, if you can believe that. He wanted to see how a frog views the world. But Thoreau never turned into a frog, which is why I believe Sesame Street was closer to the truth of the Christmas story, really. Because one time, I only watched the best television, but one time there was a skit about that old fairy tale. Of course, the princess kisses the frog and the frog turns into a handsome prince. Well, on this particular telecast of Sesame Street, it went a little different. The princess kissed the frog and that princess turned into a frog herself. That's closer to the Christmas story. You see, God did not swoop down and survey the human situation from a safe distance. No, God emptied himself of all of his power, of all of his glory, of all of his majesty and became one of us. Now that's a life altering event if we let it be. That's the beauty of tonight. That's the glory of tonight. The baby born in Bethlehem is God incarnate. You know, no other religion makes that claim. And every other religion, and there is truth and beauty in them all, and every other religion, humankind is desperately searching for the divine. For God, but in the Christian faith, a faith unlike any other that we celebrate tonight, God came searching for us. God came to us. Because you see, religion is reaching for God, but Jesus is God reaching for us. And so God came down in a very humble way, and He did not announce Himself, He didn't come on a stallion with an army. He didn't announce himself by telling politicians or telling important people. Rather, he announced his coming to humble shepherds. And he came in a little baby in a manger. So we would know that there is no place so dark. There is no place so painful. There is no place so desperate that God cannot find us and love us. You know, earlier this year, Dr. Paul Farmer died. He founded, some of you may know, the Global Nonprofit Partners in Health, 
which was known the world over of providing much needed health care in the poorest areas of Rwanda and Haiti and Eastern Europe and Latin America. And Dr. Farmer, he was a, a specialist in infectious diseases, and he also was a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, if you can believe that. He could have had the most comfortable, the most lavish, the most lucrative medical career anywhere, but instead he chose with his family to live for long periods of time in the poorest areas of the world in Haiti and Rwanda. And Dr. Farmer, he would travel to people's homes, to the poorest of homes in the poorest of areas, delivering much needed medicine and health care. And there was a time when the World Health Organization resisted the idea of treating HIV patients in Haiti who are illiterate because they said they really can't follow a strict regimen. Well, Dr. Farmer had something to say about that. And you know what he did? He created this chart based on the position of the sun that would show people when it was the proper time to take medicine. And he would train people to teach these people about the chart and train them to bring this medicine to save their lives. And after Dr. Farmer passed away, he was eulogized. And one member of his board said this about him. He had a very tender heart. He couldn't stand to see suffering and pain. It really hurt him. You see, he wasn't detached from anyone. That's the beauty of it. Folks, I'm here to tell you tonight that in the birth of Jesus Christ, God isn't detached from anyone. That's the beauty of tonight. So that we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us, that God cares about us. Because if there's not anything you receive from tonight, know this, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what these candles represent and what this beautiful music shows is that God is crazy about you and God loves you and there is no place you can go that is so dark and deep that God cannot find you and make you whole. And I'm reminded of this every time I hear about my colleague talk about when he goes every year to a Christmas tree farm to pick out the perfect tree. And he says every year he goes, he channels his inner Clark W. Griswold from Christmas Vacation, looking for the perfect tree, looking for the perfect size and the perfect shape, not too skinny, a strong, straight trunk. Well, one year he said he was at this tree farm and he was looking for the perfect tree when he ran into some friends from church, the Marshes, and he said to them, you know, this, this tree farm is beautiful. Look at all these trees. It's going to be tough to pick out the perfect tree. And Mrs. Marsh said, oh, not for me. You see, I don't look for the perfect tree. I look for one that really needs me, and then I make it beautiful. You know, that sounds like something God would say. Not just about trees or towns, but about you and me. You see, the beauty of tonight is that love came down at Christmas to take what is ugly in our life and make it beautiful. Love came down at Christmas to bring peace to our chaos and hope to our despair and joy to our loneliness and pain. God comes down, a love comes down at Christmas to, to feed our deepest hunger, to satisfy our deepest hunger. And I'm reminded of this when I look at the Gospel of Luke. I don't know if you heard it. Luke is trying to tell us this. Three times in the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells us three times about the baby Jesus being in a manger. Now, what's interesting is most of us, when we think about mangers, we think the manger was made out of wood. But the truth of the matter is, wood was very hard to come by in first century Palestine. The truth is, this manger was made out of rock. It looked something like this. Well, something like this. <laughs> That's what it looked like. It was a, it was a feeding trough where different animals would come and they would feed from it. But the question is, why in the world would Luke mention this three different times in just a few verses? Well, not only because Luke was trying to tell us that Jesus was born into poverty to two peasant parents, but also it was because of this. 
Luke was telling us that this babe, this Jesus, was born in a place where God's creatures eat. In other words, Luke is telling us that this Jesus, this baby, satisfies our deepest hungers of the heart. That's why Jesus says in Matthew, People don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from Almighty God. Jesus is telling us there that we all have deep hungers, spiritual hungers that go beyond the physical. We all have a deep hunger inside that needs to be satisfied. And that's why Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And that's the joy of tonight. You know, the writer Max Lucado put it this way, you know, what if you found a A fish, you take a fish and you throw that fish on a beach and you watch his gills just flap and his his scales become dry. Is that fish happy? Heck no, it's not happy. How do you make that fish happy? Do you dump a bunch of cash on it? Do you go get it a beach beach chair and and, and some sunglasses? Do you go find a, a magazine and a martini? Would that make the fish happy? No, what will make the fish happy? By putting it back into its element, into the water where it was created to be. You see, a fish can't be happy on the beach because the fish wasn't created to be on the beach. And it's the same way with us. There is a God-shaped void in all of us that only God can fill. And that's the power of tonight. That's the purpose of tonight. Jesus comes and we sing the praises and we light the candles because finally... That one thing, that one person can feed our deepest hunger that all of us have and all of us are searching for. All of us have that hunger. We do. Every single one of us in this sanctuary tonight has that hunger. And the irony is we try to satisfy that hunger with different things, with money or the best cars or the best homes or the best career, or success. And let me tell you, it never lasts. Just like those gifts under the tree. And those are wonderful. I'm looking forward to mine. But how long will they truly last? Here's the great irony in the history of humankind. All those trivial pursuits that we have, all those things we do to crowd out Jesus Christ are really a cry for something that only Jesus can satisfy. And that's what tonight is about. And that's why I've noticed as a pastor that many people are living lives of quiet desperation. Where does that desperation come from? It comes from a hunger that can never be satisfied. You know, I had a a man come see me some years ago. He was in my church there almost every Sunday. A very successful man. He came into my office and he was successful. He was wearing a Rolex watch. I think he drove in in a Mercedes, had the best suit on it, was good looking. And he was miserable. And he said something to me I'll never forget. He said, I'm tired of being hungry, Pastor. I said, what? Because this wasn't a man who looked like he was looking for his next meal somewhere. He said, I'm tired of being hungry. And he continued to explain, and he said, you know what? I've traveled the world. I have been everywhere. I've been on every great vacation. I've played all the great golf courses in the world. I've had all the success that I could ever have. I I have so much money, I don't know where to spend it. And I'm not satisfied, he said. And he said, this Jesus guy that you're always talking about, I think I'm in your office today because I think he's my only hope. And that's what tonight is about. Because I know all of us, many of us who have that hunger are always searching to be satisfied. And the beauty of tonight is that search is over because in Christ, God has searched for us and has found us. You know, many years ago, there was a a serious coal mining accident in the Allegheny Mountains. Many miners escaped, but three particular miners, they were trapped. 
And they didn't know if they were alive or dead and, and all these noxious gases began to build up and this intense heat began to, began to build up and they wouldn't allow any rescue crews to go down. But finally, some rescue crews were allowed to go down and there were three particular rescuers and before they went down, the television crews went towards them and interviewed one of them. And the reporter said, don't you know how dangerous it is down there? And that miner said, yes. And that reporter asked, are you still going down? And he said, yeah, they could be alive. And without saying another word, that rescuer, he put on his gas mask and he crawled into the elevator and he went down into that dark mine. You know what I think sometimes? That a similar conversation happened in heaven just before Christ emptied himself and came down to earth. I can just imagine the angels saying to Jesus, are you still going down? Are you still going down there in that place filled with darkness and hatred and pain? Are you, are you still going down there to that place where so many folks just focus on the temporal instead of the eternal? Are, are you still going down there when you know you're gonna be despised and rejected? Are you still going down there when you know the nail is going to be beat into you? Are you still going down there? Well, we don't know how that conversation occurred, but what we do know is this. The answer was yes. And the result is why we are here tonight. God in Christ came down and changed this world and offers hope and peace and love and joy and redemption to all of us. My hope and my prayer is that each one of you, each one of us experiences a very Merry Christmas when the Prince of Peace, when Emmanuel, God with us, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords loves you all the way into your heart. Let's pray. Eternal God, when we think that you would deign come down to this earth to put skin on to show your love for us oh that truth the incarnation Lord it's overwhelming which is why we seek to find expression tonight on this Christmas Eve to to worship you and the fact that you did it oh Lord I ask that every heart here tonight would experience the warmth of that love that went so far as to come down to be one of us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.